Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Digital Sovereignty Meets Data Dignity, a European Perspective. I'd like to welcome Andreas to the stage to begin our session. Hello, everybody. Andreas here from Frankfurt in Germany. And yeah, let me introduce our guest, Mario Brandenburg um, from Germany also. He's a technologist and a member of German Parliament since 2017. He is a member of the Free Democratic Party, which is a liberal democratic party in Germany. And he is also the technology spokesperson for FDP in the Bundestag and a spokesperson for the Digital Agenda Committee and study group for artificial intelligence. And as I said, I'm Andreas Fowler from the Radical Exchange chapter in Frankfurt. Mario, how are you today? How was your day to, so far? Um, first of all, hi everybody. So um, super happy and excited uh, to, to be here and uh, discuss with you in the community. So actually my day was quite long, to be honest. In Germany, there's the so-called digital day um, to basically push people talking about digital topics and bring together society. And we were hosting as well um, a show from 10 in the morning to like um, 3 p.m. Uh, we had Audrey Tang speaking and so it was um, quite cool already and so I had to somehow um, try to keep pushing me uh, waiting for that session but then afterwards I'll just probably happily grab a beer <laughs> and, and enjoy basically the evening. Great. Yeah, let's probably also later cover some of the aspects happening in Germany around the day of digitization. Just some organizational topics. Um, we have 50 minutes now. Um, you are able to post questions via Slido. We are happy to take them. Uh, we will at least take 10 to 5 minutes at the end um, to answer them. And um, yeah, questions are welcome and really valued. We are really want to engage with you. And yeah, now Mario, would you like to give us a short introduction on your initial thoughts about digital and data sovereignty? Yeah, um, absolutely. So um, first of all, as, as you've introduced me, so I was basically a tech person by many coincidences, uh, making my way into politics. Um, and the interesting part is, that basically you can see that the approach, how they think about um, all these topics, it's a bit different in general. So um, I would say it's not from a purely logical perspective, like as well, and I guess we will talk about your concepts, which mostly focus on um, logical theories and, and game theory things. But um, when you are in the daily parliament business, um, it's a different approach to go to. And the thing which convinced me to do that basically jump into the political sphere is that many things and these are the things which basically concern you as well probably will be decided right now you know um the whole discussion about serenity is a discussion about layers of serenity if we are honest so um we can see this on a data level which we will talk um but it's as well on an education level it's on a hardware level if the in a EU perspective, it's in a country plus European perspective. So we have our European um, basically data strategy written right now. You could basically file ideas there. So we, at the moment, we are really building the foundation, foundational idea, but as well law set on what probably my kids will build. And so there's lots of stuff going on from joint initiatives, like something called Gaia X, uh, we can basically tackle that where we want to have companies to work together. And for sure there are um, ideas around as well, which, which your ideas could flow in, how to empower the people or give power back to the people to some extent that they at least feel involved and hurt um, up to really like giving them money back for their data. Um, I was really interested when Andreas told me the, um, um, about radical exchange and we're sending me some papers so I know him from sales and he still is a good salesperson actually so <laughs> since I read all the papers and I'm here uh, quite good job um, and therefore as said it's really really broad and from the committees I'm in so I'm in the committee for research and education which is one big pillar of it I would say because people can only be empowered if they know what's going on 
Um, and this is why I like this initiative so much because actually radical exchange people are thinking about stuff which others might not even know that this problem exists. So the, the first pillar is empowerment. Um, the next pillar would be classical laws. That's the politician in me. And the other pillar is, and that's the area where I'm, um, where I'm focusing myself to really transfer these models into reality. Since I was a, a techie um, by nature, um, as well following um, the blockchain community or trend, for example, with the Ocean Protocol, how if there would be a regulatory frame set, how we can transfer that, that people can really use it. So that's relatively broad for the beginning, but I guess I hope we should have enough topics basically to discuss on. I'm really, really looking yeah. forward for the next minute. Thanks for this uh, introduction. Um, I heard around you are interested in implementa implementing things, <laughs> which is not common for a politician probably, or at least having this holistic view. I think there's a strong alignment with radical exchange and how we see things because you cannot divide it, um, but probably also have a first look at the more high level concepts. I mean, in Europe and Germany, uh, we are talking about digital sovereignty, Why do we talk about it? What would you say? What is the reason why it's so important now? <laughs> How many German or European products are we using right now? Huh? We are in a Zoom session. I've got Apple stuff in my ear. I've got a Surface tab laying there. So that's probably a reason why to start. So um, nothing against these companies in general, but I guess um, it's really normal that from a perspective, like from a European perspective, you really need to think about that. And And when we launched GDPR and um, GDPR compliance was a big topic, it somehow shed a light onto things which people might not have had a look before. Because, I mean, all these nice tools and platforms and things are there and we were all just using them and still using them, the social networks. But this was the moment when at least people over here started to think about, you know, when there is basically the right to be forgotten and these stuff and having your data deleted. And the first guy from Austria really asking Facebook to delete data and nothing happened. So this made the people think, wait, okay, that's, and that's strange. And we spent that much time or growing time online. So um, how many mails do I have in whatever mail accounts? And it's not that they would turn off a service, for example, Google, if they would stop working. It's not that the service is missing. It's a part of my digital life is missing. So um, I'm not the biggest Google Mail user, but still there is stuff. And this made people think about, look, okay, um, we, are, we are 27 countries here. We are a big market. How, how sovereign are we? Are we just a play field? And is this what we want to be? And really not in an offensive way. So I mean, the, the world has to grow together and not be separated. But in the end, like with, with water supply and all these things, You know, you want to know that that stuff is working. And I guess this was the moment, like after GDPR, where politicians, I mean, technicians knew it before, but politicians realized, okay, um, there's something to fix. We need to think one step further because at the moment we could not, what we are just doing, we could not probably do this with only European products. So that's not the goal to do this. I have no problem like using whatever Apple AirPods But just think about, okay, could somebody cut you off from something? And then you start thinking about all the flavors of serenity. So you mentioned the aspect of being um, sovereign as a country or as a society. Um, do you also see the need for more sovereignty for the individual or the citizens? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this, uh, absolutely. Um, so I guess this is the... The, the steps of evolution, so I would say, because um, if you are not sovereign as a whole country or continent, it's still hard to live there and be sovereign by your own, you know, if you're a landline, phone line, whatever, um, so it's not working. And I guess what, what um, you guys at Ready Exchange are discussing, so that's, that's probably the, the Champions League of it. How can basically everybody by him or herself be sovereign again? And Since I think we need to work on the full stack, because at the moment we don't we don't have any layer of that stack. That's absolutely correct. So if if I produce data, if I have data, so and 
as I learned, or as I knew, but as you nicely have written down, that my data does not necessarily be my data because it's, it's probably really always the data of a group. So thinking about ideas, how to get that sorted out is absolutely relevant. But then in the next step, if we talk about such concepts, um, basically, even if we come up with regulations with that, then the country who comes up with that regulation or the continent itself needs somehow to be able to execute that. So this is why I'm, why I'm, I would, I wouldn't discuss one layer without at least, um, having in mind the next layer to really execute it. And this is why I see it more or less as a stack with all the philosophies behind. So technology is one part, but organizations, institutions is another and the political environment also. That's and the individual, this yep. conversation also later, but probably one other question. Um, I mean, data is compared often as the new oil and at radical exchange, we call it data dignity. In the meantime, we came from data as labor, which meant, okay, it's something that's yeah, linked to a person. And that's some kind of value that a person creates and should be incentivized by that also. And now we come to the point digital uh, data dignity, which means it's a human right. It's probably the part of the most fundamental human right dignity. How do you see it? Is it oil? Is it labor? Is it dignity or something completely different? <laughs> data oh, is all of that. Are we back? Are we back in 2010? Or is like, no, um, and that's, that was, was probably ever the stupidest uh, comparison. Um, because as we all know, data doesn't go away and blah, blah, blah. It gets more valuable if you share and all that stuff is not true for oil. So it's absolutely not oil. Data as labor um, as well. I would not really agree that this is the best fit. So basically you made your way up with, with slogans. It always got better. <laughs> I would say dignity. This, this, um, this claim makes more sense in general because I mean, not every data is labor, you know, there are people who think labor is not fun, but lots of data can be fun. So you could go to that layer and argue. So um, I guess seeing it as, as dignity or something which at least I need to be in control of. Uh, and, and that's the important part. So if I have the feeling that I'm not in control of, that I'm not sovereign, that I don't have any autonomy, um, this is insulting and in the end um, might not be healthy for a person and for a society. Because in the end, like if you sum up us as, as people, we are the society. And since at the moment we are not fully in control, you can as well see that bad things in general are happening, that we, you have the discussions about fake news and all these stuff. And that's a bit part of the same story because if your data just goes somewhere or might be overblocked by whatever um, censorship filter or something, stuff happens with whatever you said, you posted your picture, and you're, you're not valued for it, doesn't even have to be money, but some stuff happens somewhere and you're out of control, then you start to believe that there must be something. There is something. Somebody is faking this or that. And this, I personally think, is one part why the world is turning that way. It's super complex, stuff is happening with you, with your data, but you are not in control. And this is what we see, that people questioning the, the bigger and higher system. And that's something which is alarming as a politician, or which should be alarming as a, as a decent politician, <laughs> let me say that way. Um, and this is why I think we need to talk about that. So it's, it's not always monetization, which is okay, it's nice. I mean, absolutely, money is always good. But it's really as well the aspect of control and the idea that I have shared this. There was a purpose which I said, okay, I'm in. Maybe the purpose is over. I want to have it back, you know, or it, at least to empower somebody to think about that. And I think with, with GDPR over here in Europe, we, we did the first step, not in this, uh, not, not uh, how should I say, not as granular as how you think about it in general, but it's at least the first step when you can say, look, it must be deleted, right, to be forgotten and these things. So that's, that's the first tiny step to go there to say, look, okay, um, that's what you need, but definitely it's not enough. So there need, there need to be ideas like basically as well as what you try to push to, I would say, for the next years and the next eras to have a different handling. Um, I'm not sure if you can just force it or snip and it's over. 
but there need to be a better way for the future. That's actually my point, and this is why I'm interested in, in basically the concepts and, and following your movement. Thanks a lot. Strong emphasis on control, which is not privacy. I think in Europe we have a good history of protecting privacy and GDPR. And what is your view on the history of German or European um, data regulation? What What's your thought about that? And probably also looking into the future, what's on the horizon? <laughs> It's a tough question because in um, theoretically it's good or it is good, but the downside to it for sure is, I just said, we don't have whatever social networks or whatever um, um, uh, providers for video telephony or stuff, because sometimes we discuss too long. So as always, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And when we were launching GDPR, what we could see, and this really was basically a downside effect of it, um, The, the, the law was designed with having the Googles and the Facebooks and all these stuff in mind, because basically this was what annoyed the people. So, but there are two areas, for example, where it really made problems. Because um, if you, we had an, or not we, no, it's not our law, but they had in mind the Googles. And they said, yeah, you have to have a contact person and you need to put up a data protection officer um, as soon as you have like nine people and you're handling data. The problem is every soccer club has like nine people and the data of the player and they were fully hidden by GDPR. So it was never the intent because we designed this or the politicians designed this to make the world better. But Google said, okay, that's fine. We have like 20 of these guys, we are in. And the Saga club said, ooh, who wants to do that? I don't want to go to prison, ooh. So you know, this is if you mean something quite good and do it, let's say not that optimal, that's a problem. And this is my, my critique we are not fast enough in iterating. It's no problem if the first draft doesn't work. But for example, my party is pushing that we talk about raising, renewing this law. We don't want to get rid, we want to renew because some things are wrong. And now it's in for two years, nothing happens. It doesn't help the soccer club. Or the next part where basically we would need an update of that law is um, think about the blockchain and think about the right to be forgotten. <laughs> So, I mean, <laughs> not the best fit. So sure, there's off-chain storing and, and you can get around, but still nobody had the blockchain in mind when doing this, which is normal. You, I mean, it's, they are lawyers, they are not technicians. So, but then if somebody flags this concern, we need to be faster, like it would be in software development. Somebody finds a bug, they look at the problem, okay, everybody sits down again and try to fix it. But in general, I think it's a good approach that we do that. As said, because it's, it was the spark who started something bigger because they, they started to realize, oh, okay, now, now, I mean, now I can get my cat photos back, <laughs> but life is more than having cat pictures back. So we need to talk about one step more about the connections between the data and everything surrounding, including 5G discussion and all of these uh, far away, but still valid discussions about being truly self -serving. Thank you. Um... It brings me to the mind, I mean, you mentioned it probably prevented some of the, let's say, innovations that though, though there is no data economy or no data-based large player from Europe, but we have protected our privacy very well, at least for European-based entities. Um, I see now that there is a stronger emphasis on making data available for the right um, purposes. And you mentioned control as one of the most important parts. Um, how do you see it? Um, is this the right way to move on, really more focusing on making data available for the right purposes, but by maintaining privacy and control? Or what do you think, think about this? I mean, absolutely. That, that must be the way. And as you said, yeah, we protected our data, but then we don't have data businesses. So, I mean, the, probably the most safe place is if I just stay here. So, okay, but then life will end quickly. I, I will starve to death. So I'm super protected, but it's not a solution. So we, we kind of overprotected a little, but not of, of schizophrenia. We come from somewhere else. I mean, we have to be fair. So uh, in Germany by nature is a decentralized country, which is super good because we, I mean, um, no offense to France, like really our friends, our neighbors, 
but it's a bit different. So you've got Paris in the middle and the rest is a bit, uh, I would say, struggling. If you see the, the German structure with all our hidden champions, I mean, there's Volkswagen in Wolfsburg and what is actually Wolfsburg, nobody knows, but there is like the Volkswagen. SAP is in the middle of a forest. I mean, nobody would ever go there, um, but it is there, you know, and so that's super healthy um, for people to live because you don't have the, the urbanization problems, which you have, like, if you want to live in Manhattan, so super expensive and you live in like a little, a little dog box. Um, and so uh, here you can still have a house and a garden. So this is why there was never, um, naturally never a place where all the stuff happened. So, but still that's, that, that doesn't mean that you can not fix it. In the end, I think we can really be stronger because now we understood that we need to basically open up and give data um, or, or share data for whatever purposes this person wants to have that. Because in the end, then we build a network. And a network is always a more powerful structure than a monolith. So because, you know, it's more flexible, um, it's in the end more ideas coming together, and you can see this, I always bring up that, that example when you look at startups or at big companies. So the startup is actually always the little speedboat and the big company is the tanker who has the issue. So unfortunately, we are in Europe, we are 20, no, Britain aside, but now we are 26 speedboats, but we move like 26 tankers, but that's our fault. So imagine how cool that actually is if one country comes up with an idea the country itself is the sandbox, and if it's cool, we scale it up. Like we got a big um, digital European single market, 500 million people, um, relatively rich society compared to a world standard. So we got all, all the, basically all the pieces, but nobody ever put them together because we were hiding these pieces, and so we never, nobody could ever see the nice picture which we could theoretically build. And this absolutely has to do with the fact that you need to convince people to share the data. So you need the reason, and then you need to tell them, look, okay, if you share it, you still be in control. And a good example, um, I mean, we are, as always, unfortunately slow, um, is like our um, the health record. When we build our electronic health record, the elektronische Personenakte. So this will be that way. You can go to a doctor and can say, look, okay, this doctor can see this and that, but not that one. And then you go, whatever, to pharmacy, and you have, have your role-based permission for your own data records. So, and I think when this one is launched, people learn about doing that. We were in IT, so we know how whatever LDAP works, how role-based permissioning for tools work, but ordinary people never have done that stuff. So they never had in whatever the library, I see the books behind you. So there was never a role-based permissioning for access of your favorite book or something. That's techy stuff. So, but as soon as this, this like ripples in your normal life, people will get that idea and say, oh yeah, why, why not give away uh, the data, whatever, of my, uh, of how of I, I, whatever, cut my tree or somebody might need it, who knows? And then at least there must be platforms or that there must be a regulatory framework to allow them to do that. Because even if you want to do that right now, I mean, where do you, where, like where to put your data, <laughs> put it in USB stick and whatever, FedEx it to Amnesty International. I mean, it's just not there, you know, and this is the part where we need to be become better in Europe. Yeah, makes sense. Um, you mentioned Gaia-X already, which is a project that I think aims into this direction at the end, um, building an ecosystem Europe-wide to really... Um, come up with the next level, I would say, of um, data-based businesses, data-based um, services. Can you talk a little bit about Gaia-X? What your thoughts are on Gaia-X? Yep, so that's, that's a relatively concrete example of how we, and if I say we, it's now it's Germany and France together already, they already um, basically funded an entity, a Belgium entity that is close to the European Parliament. I know that Netherlands, Spain, Austria, like many other countries uh, want to join and many companies as well from Japan, South Korea, because they like the idea and the mentality behind. So the thing is, we want to build 
not 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 another hyperscaler or something you know let's face it i mean amazon web services um they are good because they are good but they never they never rang somebody up at three at midnight we're beating the shit out and say sign this contract they were just good so but the problem for a startup then over here is if they go into that ecosystem they might never go out so because i mean it's the programming model it's, it's the community it's whatever so and if you only need for example let's say a weather service for whatever reasons you start a project need a nice and decent weather service if you go to google and if you google it there is <laughs> there's a high chance that you will end up with some amazon or google product so if there would be gaia x you know this is a european wide standard which makes these things interoperability and all that stuff and you look that up and you see there might be a startup in spain which is maybe a bit more expensive which is logic to market reasons so we don't the state is not financing it or something we believe still in in all the the market laws but then you know okay look like the stuff is hosted basically here in europe somewhere can be the service could be spanish the hosting could be done in france um, but still you have the the european data protection law there is no cloud act um, whatever um in that case president wants to see or read your stuff so you're here you're in basically the, the safe european region and you can still do all of that thing maybe with three or four providers but if we get it managed that basically you just buy a gaia service and then maybe you can change so it's a lot about making interoperability work it's a lot about um, harmonizing documentation harmonizing deploying models and the cool thing is, if you would have come up with that five years earlier, companies would have said no. Because, I mean, the companies in there are still competitors. So there is there's Telecom in there, there's SAP in there, um, but there's also an um, Orange in there. And so they are competitors and they will remain competitors. But the things which have changed is they understood that cooperation for good, that making somehow building the bridge and come up with really a strong network and an ecosystem that's the way how you can have an offer which basically is attractive like what amazon builds like one box so and amazon might still be a bit cheaper or a bit more like um yeah streamlined but still then you have to consider where your data goes and um and that reason that catch where your data goes this is basically the problem of guys like Amazon and Facebook. So that's, that's basically what they earn. So when we had this discussion, like, uh, if you tell something like that, what will they say? People say, oh, that's, that's super. It sounds too national. We shouldn't do that. I mean, it's America. And yes, I mean, Americans are our friends. But, you know, these companies had a very strange way to some extent uh, to, to be friends. Or let's say the Cloud Act is not the most, it's not the thing which you would do to your friends. So, uh, and this is why companies feel more safe um, to be on a German or, or, or the European law system where basically data privacy is something different and no government then basically uh, can say, okay, look, I want to look into your data. And so Gaia X hopefully will be a success. It's already, the, the entity was built by 22 companies, 11 French companies, 11 Germans. They are growing at the moment. They have, in total, they are 300 companies, and I think they already have 120 use cases, which they can build. And it really goes from health data through um, rather more IoT things, um, plus the German state itself is looking into basically become Gaia ready and um, basically go down that way of documenting, go down that way of uh, having open data, having the data formats they are discussing. And the fun part is, to, to stop my lengthy monologue, the fun part is that after a while, Microsoft was asking, Amazon was asking, Google was asking, and they were allowed to join. There was a discussion if, if it's okay to let them join, but it's split in pillars. And in the tech pillar, sure, they can participate because these companies are technically the premier. So that's super, but they are not allowed to join the entity and they're not allowed to join the legal framework layer. So, but we are happy if Google says we are Gaia ready, that's super because that might be the solution of the login effect. 
and you can argue that people then can go from Gaia to Google. Yes, because we are still um, living in a democracy. We still believe in an open market. And that's explicitly the difference between doing protectionism and shitty national thinking. But we are just starting to train. We want to get bigger and stronger and faster and smarter. We don't want to shoot the guy in the leg who is running faster. So that's the idea of being nationalist and passing laws. Our idea is basically to train and to convince that this is the way to go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I also like the, the idea of um, an ecosystem of equals. Um, um, also not building another centralized power, but really keeping it decentralized, but make it composable and work, make things work together. So at the end, it's about standards. It's about how to um, combine different services, which is also a technical challenge. And what I also like is the, the strong commitment to open source, which is, I think, okay. also very much yeah, in alignment with what we think at Radical Exchange. So really cool project. And of course, it's not only a tech project, it's including the government and it's also including the users and the, let's say, the interest and the participation is very high. So I'm also looking very much forward to what comes out of that project. I mean, it's, it's for from a state perspective, so from a governmental perspective, um, it's definitely the, the tougher part is not in tech. So the moment when basically competitors said, okay, look, we need to come up with deployment models that I can go from whatever on premise into the cloud, from open source to blah, blah, blah. This is what they understood because in the end, doesn't matter how, how powerful you are. I mean, surely SAP is a super cool company, but I mean, compared uh, to the market share and the value of whatever Google, um, still tiny. And so the, and as well for the Deutsche Telekom or, or T-Mobile and all that stuff. So they learned that they have to team up. So to sort out the interfaces and to find the money to open up, that's on them. So again, the, the German state is not paying any engineer. We are not paying any interface to be built. So because this then would be more socialism. So we still believe in the free market. These guys have to manage. But the, the real good step, and even was not my party, but you see I'm strongly supporting it, was to basically offer a nice room, put some cookies in there and say, look, guys, sat together. Um, we are basically the moderators. And if you see where there are regulatory problems, so there is the minister, um, basically, he will listen. So, you know, it was the, the, the team spirit to put all of them in the room and the government as a referee. That's really how I want to have it as, as liberal in the classical German liberal, not, not leftish sense. I know that the word liberal from country to country, it's a bit different. So we're really like centered and market oriented. So, and this is how a state should be a referee because there is the, the there are startups in there. There is the chaos computer club, which is basically an NGO for, for um, yeah, hacking and data security. So it's really like um, people with um, societal interests, people or companies with lots of money. And the state is only the referee to say, look, um, try it together. We are here, and if there's a problem, tell it to us. And this is, I think, it took a long time, but that's a clever way of understanding politics. So, um, because I really don't think that politicians are good economists, and they are even worse technologists. So, but they should basically sit there and try to balance the interests and talk to people like you with Radical Exchange to basically get a different view on it, um, squeeze nice ideas in, so, and, and these are the things how I think it can grow and can be successful. Let, yeah, thank you. Let's move to the topic of governance and how to organize it apart from technological topics. We have one question in from the Slido. I will just post it to you. Um, question is from Ray. It's about if we are a society who gives control to politicians and other top-down systems? Can we transition to individual sovereignty without mass distress? What's your point on that? Moving to individual sovereignty, you must like it. I mean, pr probably not next week. <laughs> so, no, I have a, a big question, a good and a big question. I mean, who, who gives power to the politicians? So. Voters, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, vote, vote. I mean, yeah. In in good countries, voters, yes, uh, and all of them. 
So uh, yes, but but then still, it's it's always okay to question that. So um, I think from where we are coming, it's probably quite logical that the system is how it is. That you go to vote and you send people to a place like in Germany, Berlin. And so I'm one week back home for the region I represent, and one week I'm in Berlin to basically tell them how my region thinks about it. So that's natural. I mean, there there was no virtual life. There was there was no chance of having Zoom sessions or whatever. That's okay, but I definitely think we can open up, and uh, this is as well what we were discussing with Audrey Tang, basically in the the panel. I don't know five weeks, uh, no five hours ago, so long day already. Um, to really give them the chance to vote on a topic, or at least let's say express the will on a topic, to really vote on a topic, it's next step. I'm not always a hundred percent sure if to really vote on it. Like then that the vote is the result is always good because to be honest, if you, before I said, yes, 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 we have to do it. Um, now you can say, yeah, now you're a politician and you don't listen to the people. No, because sometimes you really have to work and think about a topic for like two or three months. And then it's just not possible to ask one question. So really think about what the, the British people were asked. Do you want to leave Europe? So. And if you see why they said, I mean, there was refugee crisis. So I think for 60% said refugee crisis is a big thing. But right now, trying to do a Brexit, they see it so much more. So there are definitely questions which more like yes and no question. I think you can do them absolutely directly to ask the people, which is, I would say, it's, it's really existing stuff. Like, do you want to have a road there? Should there be a bridge? So that's a yes and a no question because we don't think about what will this bridge be in 20 years or something? But other discussions like that, I think you should ask your people, uh, what is your stand on that and why? You know, and if you see that currently there is whatever trend going on and 80% would say we leave Europe to whatever trend is just going on, I don't know, maybe they lost the finals in the World Cup to Germany. <laughs> no, they would say, yeah, we're leaving them. So, but and you would be probably off with a relatively bad decision. So empowerment, absolutely. We, we need these tools. I mean, Taiwan is a super role model there. Um, and then I guess the system will absolutely open up by itself because for a politician, it's as well not really funny to take a decision and to go out and get beaten because the answer is too long to explain. And that happens quite often, to be honest. Um, so like Europe now is, um, or with all the, the rescue packages globally. I mean, lots of money is just produced, you know, it's just coming from somewhere. We are doing stuff right now, which basically our kids will face for a lot of time. And it's not easy to explain all of that. And if you just vote, should we do this yes or no? Um, that's not a yes or no question because it has many flavors, like will the economy go down? Like how many people will starve? You know, not, not saving the economy in Germany, means something different, like not helping the people in Bangladesh. So, um, and this is why I think we should go that way. But I really think at least for Germany as an old grown democracy with a rather elderly society, we need to do this in little steps and convince them that there is benefit and open up much more things. And I think in local politics, where they really talk about bridges and should the light be LED, should it be turned off at night, these are super things to start with that, whereas what we have on federal level, um, I think it's too hard to say yes and no because there are too many interests piled up, which at least you should somehow uh, take into account and somebody should do that who really has the time to think about that and we have that time. So if you take your, uh, if I take my role seriously as a politician, um, I only have that job, I don't do any other job. I really have time to think about topics. And if you do your job carefully, you realize that there are many things which probably not good um, to vote on them as a final conclusion. But right now we don't even ask the people. Um, that's definitely not the model how it should remain. Okay, so you would like to have more participation of citizens, but probably a representative democracy is proven and it, there are good reasons to have this ongoingly and yeah i mean you also on the road to yeah. on the road to we can talk about that but with every with every system like if i give you whatever a surfboard right now 
So <laughs> you'll probably not be the best surfer. And as I said, it's an old grown democracy. We are not very digital. So um, if you say we do digital voting, <laughs> I don't know if you get 100% of Germans, so that's unfair as well. So I'm absolutely for opening it up. And um, the tools Audrey introduced to really get quick feedback from, from uh, the people. And this would have helped, for example, if you think about what I said uh, for GDPR, if you would have had quick feedback tools, we would see that all the social clubs um, basically were complaining. Otherwise, somehow, you know, we had to collect this, it took some time, and then basically the law was passed. So it would even make lawmaking faster. And that's a point which I criticize. Um, it's too slow what we are doing, and definitely more liquid and direct democracy can fix it. But I don't think that's the solution to everything. Yeah. And we, we have an idea, quadratic voting, and already probably also talked about this approach being experimented about. I think there is quite probably experimentation needed to really gather real life experience, as we digital people say. <laughs> And um, so let's um, move on. Uh, okay, we have 10 minutes left. So let's move on to another question from the audience. Um, the question is from Anonymous. Um, it's um, about data protection and data handling by corporations. Do you sense that regulators are always running after technological changes and innovation? I mean, to some extent, yes, regulators are always behind. Um, I don't think regulators should be in front, to be honest, um, because this would mean that politicians or regulators are smarter than the people who are doing this all day to earn their living. So that's the other side of the story. Um, if you ask 700 people in Germany who were elected for whatever reason um, to say what is right or wrong over somebody who is doing stuff all the time, that can't be the solution as well. And in, I would say in 90% of the cases, it's not a problem that regulation comes afterwards because this is how you do, you see, um, you, you elaborate on it and then you pass a law. So, but the point, the, the true point in that question is that with all the technological changes, it became faster, all the changes became faster, they became global, everything is exponential now. And then basically the gap became bigger and that's the problem so that they are behind like being a little behind is not that problem if you think what we did with automotives and stuff and for example in england there was a law that when when running a car somebody with a red flag needs to walk in front to say hey there is a car coming so you know this is a typical example of a regulator being in front so luckily we skipped that one so but with all the tech stuff and the data stuff um basically the distance was growing and that was too much. <clears throat> and so the regulators now need to go in, but going in, and this is the, the thing what we are discussing here, what does going in mean? And so this is where the political directions have different opinions. So if you still believe in um, a social market situation as we have it here over in Germany, the Soziale Marktwirtschaft, so then you only go in when something is too much, but you would not, whatever, split up a company or something. This is, this is the last resort. And for example, if we talk, um, if we use Amazon, so they are absolutely at the limit that you need to look at it. I mean, um, yeah, if you have Amazon shares uh, since COVID and before, lucky you. So, but not that many people were having uh, such a party as Amazon uh, with COVID because they are the biggest delivery store. So it's okay. But then we have to talk about their marketplace and Amazon's choice. So we are not against the platform model in general. It's still a valid business model, but it depends how many sides of that platform you are. This is the discussion, but that's my personal political opinion. If you're on the left side, they see it different. On the right side, they see it different. So we have to talk about how many sides of this platform are they? And just being an extremely good platform basically to buy something is okay. But having all the data of all the sellers and knowing that a product sells really nicely and then selling it one cent cheaper because you can get it cheaper and say it's Amazon's choice and always having it at the front, not okay. So this is the point where you could go in. And these are basically the things which we are discussing where to go in in case we need to because we all have to be honest. If we look at Alphabet or Google, I mean, Google Mail is Google Mail because 
it was good and google search is google search because it was good so if we just split them off or, or just try to whatever split them then we have still an extremely good mail client an extremely common search bar so you know that that might not be the solution so if you play a little game and you lose um then probably think about the game design but not about killing the other player so and and this is the the bit of a difference here but i really think there are there are points where where it's okay to think about it and as said with amazon these are things um which the eu commission as well is discussing so if you follow market vesaga our liberal commissioner i mean she finds google <laughs> I, i don't know every six months so uh, mr trump calls her the european tax lady which we find it quite funny but i mean she is doing actually these things you know google by itself is not the problem but having everything pre-installed and messing around with the search results not going to happen so we need a fair market so at the end you say um there are some let's say data network effects that um give incumbents data incumbents uh, an unfair advantage about the rest of the uh, the 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 economy and um so um but these effects just just let me join in so if we would have a, a good alternative and i guess this is the thing you know with i mean facebook is now there it's over but if another solution would come up where basically we could get a fair share of the data i mean what you're pushing for which as well i can share stuff with my friends and i have the same effect that's okay then we can talk about basically building a, a level playing field again and people will do that as i mean that's the same as with gaia so people now care where to put the data if is europe or china so and this is they have shown they can learn that so it's not about um being against networks effects that's a natural effect i mean if you, if you're single and you go to a party it's as well network effect you go there where people are you don't go into a bar and say yeah i mean nobody's there but it's pretty cool so you know i'm safe here so <laughs> i mean we made them big um but this is why i'm so interested in following your movement if if it works out to create a really good alternative and this is what politicians can or should do having a level playing field there i'm super sure people will move i mean they moved from myspace to facebook to whatever now facebook is actually dying they went to instagram tiktok it just never went better from a data perspective like even with tiktok being the, the worst probably but it shows that they are moving so unfortunately there was no safe harbor to go but safe harbor by itself um as well as something else and just did not have that good history <laughs> because the, the safe harbor agreement was as well <laughs> a bit of a problem three minutes to go i have one question from matt um it's about um data disclosure by uh, that's probably um imposed by different persons who have rights on the data so the question is do you think of data disclosure by a person as an activity with externalities because it reveals data by data of other persons so at the end um the question is probably there are different people having rights on the same data how to deal with it what's your thoughts on that yeah um that's that's probably the most interesting part you're pushing i mean absolutely it's true that the example with uh, with your genome absolutely right um and sure it is that way i mean it's um and there's no discussion around it it's already like um i mean you, you can't post a picture here in germany um if somebody else is on the picture without having the agreement of that person so absolutely this already shows that we have this in our basically law box but we don't execute it um in that way or never has thought it in that in that i would say a next level of it talking about the genome and that's absolutely um a real and a valid point and let me the last minute just maybe as an uh, yeah, as an idea of food for thought i think with the word data itself we start to struggle even in germany i mean we can say it's personal and non personal data but imagine you're in a chemical company and you only have explosives or non explosives as a category for all your chemicals good luck mm -hmm. um starting producing So and if we remember when we were kids like in the chemical classes the periodic system 
you know, where it says, um, yeah, it's, it's fluid, it's whatever. I think we probably going there because data, I like one word for all the stuff, which it can be, <laughs> it's pretty impressive that we managed it until here. So I think adding up to that idea of being a data for myself or more person, we need basically something like a periodic system for data, maybe not that many flavors as the real one has, but I think we are running, we are running at the edge of the possibility with the word data, because it's super different if I talk about my email address or my genome. I mean, it's like it's a bit of a, a bit of a difference in between. All right, we are at the end of this talk. Thanks, Mario, for sharing your insights, for joining the Radical Exchange community for today. Any last remarks from your side? Anything you want to give as a last information to the Radical Exchange community? Uh, since, since I'm German and I need to be punctual, and I know that other people are already yeah. waiting, I, I won't be a politician and, and do a long speech. No, just um, it was fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, keep on going with your work. And I'm basically following what you're launching. And as well, I I'm already have an idea how to do pragmatic voting over here or how to push it. So, uh, yes, stay tuned. Great. <laughs> Thanks for joining from, from our side also, and thanks to the community and the movement for participating. Um, yeah, as you know, we have different chapters in Europe. I'm from Frankfurt. We have a chapter in Berlin, in Barcelona, Brussels, Paris, Milano, Lisbon, Oslo, Amsterdam, and Zurich. So if you are not yet part of these chapters and are interested to join the uh, Radical Exchange Movement, please feel free to reach out to any of the officials. And just one last hint on other talks that might be of interest in regards to the topics just discussed. We have a talk on data cooperatives in the real world. Yeah, today at 11 p.m. Central European time. And we have a talk on collect collective bargaining for data by Matt on Saturday, 9 a.m. Central European time. So I suggest you to join these calls uh, talks also. Yeah, and by that I close this call. Thanks, Mario. <laughs>